thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Barry Erickson, and I'm Community Engagement Coordinator here at Wheaton Public Library. Tonight, we are delighted to bring you another art demonstration provided in partnership with the DuPage Art League. Founded over 60 years ago, the DuPage Art League is dedicated to promoting and encouraging the visual arts through classes, workshops, gallery exhibits, and public programs such as this one. We are grateful to the Art League for arranging tonight's demonstration by acclaimed artist and teacher, Dan Danielson. Right now, I'm gonna turn uh, the mic over to Sandy to introduce Dan. Thank you, Barry. Hello, I am Sandy Winter. I am Vice President of Activities at the DuPage Art League. And if you are watching this program virtually and you're outside of the Chicagoland area, please let us know where you are located. Just leave a chat uh, in the comments and we would record that. Interested to see how far away people are uh, located. Well, thank you for joining us as we, in partnership with the library, host artist Dan Danielson. Mr. Danielson is a graduate of the American Academy of Art. He enjoyed a 40 year career in advertising as an art director and a creative director in Chicago. After retirement, Dan started a second career in teaching art and has taught watercolor for 11 years at the DuPage Art League, in addition to workshops at the Peninsula School of Art in beautiful Door County. He has also led workshops and demos for many art leagues, schools, and clubs. Please help me welcome Dan Danielson. Wow. Uh, first of all, Fan, Sandy, thank you so much. Uh, Barry, uh, thank you a whole lot. Uh, DuPage Art League, Wheaton Public Library. Um, this is really a pleasure, pleasure to be here. And um, uh, Sandy, you had mentioned a, a brief uh, background on, on my career and all that. You know, 40 years in advertising and art director, creative director and all that stuff, you know. And I love that, it was great, but time to retire. Uh, and then what do you do? Uh, I decided, well, I'd start uh, doing some, some artwork and all that. And then I started teaching at the DuPage, DuPage Art League and I've been doing that for the last, uh, last 11 years or so. Uh, and that pretty much sums it up, that's it. 40, 40 years of my career, or 50 years, like in like 30 seconds. However, 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 there's one thing, Sandy, you did not say. Uh, you didn't mention it. It was a very important part of my his, art history about me, you know, that um, it, it influenced me quite a bit. You didn't mention it. And it happened. Uh, well, let, let me first of all back up a little bit. Uh, in the Boy Scouts, they have what they call merit badges. I don't know if you're familiar with that. But merit badges are basically a, an award that you, that you get. And uh, it's uh, based on a, a skill level, or uh, you meet the requirements for any of the outdoor uh, activities, you know, camping, hiking, uh, cooking, first aid, uh, canoeing, all, all those things, you know, and you, you meet the requirements and then you get your, your little merit badge and you put it on your uniform. Well, uh, when I first started out in Boy Scouts, um, I thought, oh, cool, merit badge, I want to do that. Um, and they have merit badges for everything, pretty much, you know, chemistry and, and, and stamp collecting and you name it, they have it. So you can guess which one attracted my eye right away. And I was like 12 years old. And I thought, well, man, art, the art merit badge. How cool is that? So I got the booklet. Everything is done in booklets and all that. Nothing, everything's on, online now. Uh, I got the booklet and I studied it. And it, 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 you have to know all the art media and all that. And, uh, and I got my art merit badge. And it was like my first merit badge, okay? And I was a new Boy Scout. And so I sewed it myself on my uniform. I think, I think, I think you, you sewed it onto your sleeve, you know? So I had my one art merit badge. And then we had a troop meeting uh, and all the patrols get there and all the Boy Scouts get there in the troop meeting. And I'm walking in really cool because now I'm not only a Boy Scout, but I'm an artist, you know? Because I'm having, my, I have my art merit badge and I was walking around, you know, showing off my art merit badge. And another Boy Scout comes along, and he was uh, in the Boy Scouts for like uh, a few years more than I had been. I was kind of new. This one guy, uh, one Boy Scout comes along, and he comes walking by, and I'm there with my art merit badge, and he comes, he has a sash. You know, the Boy <laughs> Scout sash? 
He's got merit badges. Right. You know, he's got everything. Soil and water conservation, you know, and astronomy and geology and cooking. And he's got all these merit badges. He's walking and I'm standing there, oh. And so he's walking by and I, I, uh, um, I said, wow, that's really cool with all the merit badges. And uh, he says, what's, what's that? I said, well, this is art. And this is, this is why I'm telling this long story. He said, oh, that's easy. <laughs> and, 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 and there goes the wind out of my sails, you know. And oh, oh, it's, sometimes it's not so much what they say, it's how it's said. So it's like, oh, that's easy. And then I still remember that. I was like 12, and I still remember that. And, um, and then we it distracted, and then he, he took off, and he walked his own way, and I, and I kind of went my way. Well, I got a lot of merit badges after that. You know, I got the sash, I got the merit badges. But that first one was so important. And I thought later on, you know what? It was kind of easy. For me, it was fun. And, and it was easy, you know, because I really enjoyed uh, getting that. Uh, fast forward a few years later, I had a friend who was in high school, and he took a physics class. I took a couple art classes. I liked art classes. You know, I took a minor in art. And we started talking. He took physics. He went on to be a doctor. And he said, well, yeah, uh, we had lunch one time. I said, oh, yeah, your kids, you know, if you want a good grade, you take art. It's easy. Oh, my gosh. What's going on here? So um, I, was, I was thinking, I, I think in this country is, is, first of all, I just want to set this up. Maybe we'll get into the demo in a, in a second or two. But I think in this country, um, art does, is not recognized. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it doesn't get the respect or it's not as valued as it is in many uh, other countries. Now, the fact that you're all here means that you're interested in art. And I wish we had more art schools. I wish we had more art events. I wish we had just more interest and in, in desire to enjoy art. And I'm not just talking about watercolor or drawing or painting, but also music uh, appreciation and, um, uh, performance uh, uh, art, uh, dance, and just, I don't know, all the arts that are out there, we don't appreciate them. And we don't, I think we can learn a whole lot from them. And I think that they are probably, probably art, and all the arts are probably even more important than chemistry, merit badge, or geology, or cooking, or first aid. I think art is at the beginning of civilization. When you really think about it, it was art that started civilization. Really. I mean, art came before science. Art came before religion. Art came before magic, so to speak. It, it came before language. Art was the first language. That's how they communicated, you know, way back when. And we'll talk about that a little later. On. So I'll show you a couple of examples of that. So um, I just, I guess my point is that before we get into it, it it's, it's a lot more than, you know, some skinny guy getting up here and painting a watercolor, which I enjoy. But, um, and it can be, it is easy. It's fun. It's like riding a bicycle. If you know how, it's easy. Um, and, and the fun part is there's, there's no real right or wrong. In art, there's no real right or wrong. Technically, there are ways of doing something better than you can before. But uh, in, in a sense, um, uh, it, it, it's so so valuable, art itself. Some of the Asian countries, Europe, you go to Europe, art, I think it's a little, maybe appreciated a little bit more. I think art is, is, is embedded in their, in their culture more, I think. You walk down the street and there's mosaics on the outside walls of buildings. Holy cow. That's that. That's it's it's great. I I think enjoyed. So I, I'm reading a, a, a couple of history books, and there was a quote in one of the history books that kind of summed it up. I thought here, um, and I wrote it down because I want to make sure I got it right. It is believed that at one time there was a need to create art for human survival. So art was needed to survive. Now I'm talking about going back you know, cavemen times, you know, I mean, really a long time ago, but it was actually a way of surviving. 
And uh, at one time, this is another line, at one time it was believed that art controlled our lives. Art controlled our lives. And how do you think, well, how did it do that? Well, it influences how we lived in hunting and uh, in the days of hunting and gathering. Um, art was a way of, of making sure that you did the right thing to survive because that was the only thing you really had control of. Now, here again, I'm talking about days when people just before language almost. Um, and uh, so I, I just I just want to lay that basic foundation, lay down that basic foundation. With it. So um, art connects us together. Uh, art connects us as a society, as people. It connects us with nature. Um, it connects us with ourselves. We become more aware of, it balances us, us out. You know, if we're anxious, um, art will relax us. If we are, if we're, we're, we're just happy, you know, uh, or excited, it will balance us out. If we're, we, we want to know something about anything, study it by through, through, through art, artwork itself, you know. I'd say the best way to learn something is to draw it. Today in class we had we were doing a I think on violin, we do we, we did a violin a guy playing a violin. So uh, one of the uh, um, one of my students brought in an actual violin today because we were looking at we were studying we were it was really fascinating because uh, we do we do we're not encumbered by reality you know um, so as artists we were not supposed to be. So anyway, um, what else did I want to say? I just, that's all I want to say. Uh, it's the beginning of civilization. So think of that. And I'll show you a couple of examples of that a little later on. Um, so I have a couple of slides maybe we can uh, show. What do you think, Barry? Huh? And uh, should I should stand here. That would be good. Okay, you probably met this guy. Really, uh, you probably saw him before. Um, I, I just in, in, enjoy uh, uh, animals. I, I, I like to draw a lot of different things, not just barns. And they always say if your if your if your watercolor isn't working, if it's not working, just put in a lighthouse, <laughs> and it will work. You know, so that's that's what we do. So, um, uh, but we do more in class. We always do a lot more than lighthouses. We do all kinds of things. And right, this this particular presentation will be about pretty much animals, uh, nature. Um, studying, looking, uh, don't get trapped into reality. Uh, it's an interpretation. Okay. All right. You can switch. Let's let's focus on watercolor because that's, that's what I like. Um, but it is the oldest medium. I mean, it is really old. It, it goes. Uh, it's older than any. You name the you name a medium. Watercolor is older. Okay. Um, whatever it is. Um, it goes back to France, caves that have been, I, I was fortunate enough to visit uh, a couple of caves in Spain um, and uh, seeing some, uh, I mean, really old art, some of the oldest art around. It's, it's, it's fascinating to think that people actually did that. Next, please. Um, also, um, the palette on top is an actual real palette that's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, it's 34,000 years old. Okay, 34,000 years old. And this is actually in the museum. And the palette bomb, well, that's mine. Okay, and that's my, it's actually, I'm using it today. It's right there. And you actually have uh, there's some uh, flyer around here that shows the colors. But, but, Come on, this is 3,400 years old, and this is mine is like, what, three years old? Mm -hmm. You know? And, and what's fascinating about it is the pigments are pretty much the same. What they, uh, what they used back then, Egyptians, uh, they used pretty much the same colors, pretty much the same color, and the same minerals that were taken out of the ground. I mean, that's how you make, that's how you make paints and colors. You make, take things out of the ground, organic, inorganic, minerals or whatever, grind them all up, put them together with a binder of some sort. The binder is basically to make sure that the, the powdered pigment sticks to something. They would use gum arabic or something out of a, 
tree sap or whatever, they would take the pigment, the tree sap, and water as the carrier, and you have watercolor. Well, guess what? That's, that's what we do today. It's exactly the same stuff, the same. Uh, um, now, they do have some synthetic pigments, too, but pretty much the same thing. Next. Uh, are teaching you to see the world through the eyes of another, often a person who sees more deeply than you do. Okay. Um, can you imagine back in, in the, day, the Egyptian days that um, they, the Egyptians discovered the pigment blue? Up until that point, everything was uh, uh, earth tone colors. You know, the red oxides, yellow ochres, reds and yellows and, and carbon, black. Um, so you see a lot of those colors in cave drawings. Well, Egyptians come along and they discovered blue. Can you imagine what a big breakthrough that must have been when they did that? Um, and they did it by just uh, heating up certain minerals and blending them together. And all of a sudden, this blue pops up. So that's why you see a lot of blue in Egyptian paintings and all that. Next, please. 36,000 years ago, a cave of uh, Altamira, Spain, I was there, uh, and it was kind of really fascinating to go into this cave and see a painting like this. Um, 30, uh, 36,000 years ago, um, uh, just like that, with red oxide paints and, and, and carbon pencil, uh, carbon pencil, carbon uh, and charcoal. And we use the same thing, same colors, the same thing, okay? Um, next. Next, please. So anyway, one of my one of my assignments in my class is that we do that. We we kind of take the same colors and we simulate a cave drawing. So this is one that I did about a year or so ago, and it wasn't in a cave. It was actually my man cave, I guess, uh, in my in my 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 basement. So we did that, and we did that in class too, just to get a feel of what it was like, um, to understand that, to to again respect what those people were doing back then in a cave, black cave, completely black cave. They didn't have lights. They didn't have cameras. They didn't have phones to take it. They went out, they would look at things and in their mind, they'd go back into a black cave, usually in the dark recesses of the cave with a torch and they would make these wonderful paintings. Not this one, this one's mine. Uh, next please. Uh, the watercolor characteristics that I enjoy, it's transparent, it's fluid, it's unpredictable, it's fluid, and it's fun. I mean, that's, that's what it's all about. I mean, that's what watercolor is. Uh, and it it's, it's, can be chaotic, and it can be, uh, you can be in control. Um, it, it's, it's everything. It's, so if, if, you, if you're a person who likes to be in control of things, don't take watercolor. Uh, if you are a person who likes to be in control of things and would like to break out of that and say, well, you know what, I'm a controlling type person, but I would like to be able to loosen up a little bit, you know, and have a little more fun and, and don't worry about always having to be right all the time. This gets back to that balancing act. You know, if you're a controlling person, you say, hey, yeah, maybe I'll just relax a little bit. You know, it's not that bad. Um, it's fun to do. That's what we do. Next, please. Guess what? I uh, capture not the reality. Uh, I don't paint reality. I paint the interpretation or I paint the, the feeling, the spirit. And that's what I try to do with animals, too. So the animals may not be exactly accurate as such. Even like the violin that we painted uh, wasn't exactly. I found out there, my violin wasn't exactly completely accurate, but it, 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 it looked right. Let me put it that way. If it looks right, it's okay. Yes, next, please. Capture the roar. That's what we do. Um, and the colors, too. Come up with your colors. Your colors are important. You're the artist. Um, um, if you want blue in your lion's face, put in blue. It's, that's okay. And that's what makes it fun, too. Next, please. Uh, Seeing is important in being an artist, being able to see things and study it, think, thinking about it, interpreting. Um, and um, Paint Express, this is a, actually on, on a, a UPO, uh, which is not really a paper. It's almost like a plastic. 
and you paint on plastic and it's like painting on ice. And it's like, whoa, I, mean, I don't know where I'm going. Um, and, that even, and, and if you're a controlling person, this is really, because you can just see that the, uh, the paint just slides over it like you're painting on glass, you know. Um, and it takes a little getting used to, but it's really kind of fun results if you get it right, you know. Try it, you know. Next, please. Paint this guy above. Yep. Uh, next, please. Mushroom village below. I, I, I looked out my uh, kitchen window one, one morning and these mushrooms had popped up overnight. I was fascinated by it. But I went out there with my phone and laid on the ground and took a picture of it. <laughs> Hope the neighbors didn't see that. Um, and uh, next, please. Mm. Capture the energy. That's what we do. This was actually a stuffed animal. Stuffed animals are a lot of fun. I like to go down to the museum, go down to uh, uh, the field museum. Um, and you get really close to these animals that are very ferocious, but they're stuffed, which is good. <laughs> and you can you do a drawing and uh, do that's fun. Next, please. That's a word can be common and humble. Oh, paint a fly. When was the last time you painted a fly? Rarely. You know, you probably painted a lighthouse, but not a fly. Next, please. <laughs> Anybody know what animal this is? Yeah. No. Nope. Probably doesn't. It's, it's a kinkajou. Have you ever heard of kinkajou? <laughs> kinkajou, I mean, they're... Uh, I'm not quite sure if they're marsupial. No, I don't know, but uh, that's they're just kind of it was kind of, it's kind of fun. He's just he was kind of it was a photo. It was actually a stuffed animal I saw someplace. It was in I forgot some museum I saw, and he was like that's the way he had him posed. You know, he's upside down. I figure he probably doesn't do that all the time, but I'm just saying this is one I saw. Yes, pl uh, next please. Lighthouse. <laughs> Put in a lighthouse. You can't go wrong. You know that's always fun, but it's not so much. This is not really about a lighthouse, though, really. What is it about? Why? It's about it's about nature. It's about the environment. It's about the chaos. It's not about a lighthouse. So anybody can paint a lighthouse, but can you capture um, that 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 uh, that feeling, the the terror, you know, or whatever, the the the, the strength of, of nature? Okay, next, please. <laughs> ant, paint an ant. Look at it up, up closer. Fascinating. I mean, fascinating just to paint uh, an ant. So, anyway, next, please. Give yourself permission, let go of perfection, enjoy uh, nature, uh, the nature simplicity, see flawed beauty. And it, it's really all about, um, I think, um, when we think of beauty, sometimes we think of painting the perfect rose or that perfect flower. Um, it's a lot more than that. Look beyond that. After it wilts, look at a wilted flower. In, in my in my home, I have some wilted flowers. Not because I didn't water them, but because they're past their prime and they just look really cool. I mean, they really look cool. You know, they're wilted up, and it's like it's like an like a senior citizen. Like you know, <laughs> you don't take a senior citizen and just throw them out the door. You know, they're in my living room, and I'm looking at. I'm looking at this really cool, some old leaves and all that, you know. Um, they have a story. There's a story to tell there, I think. Um, so that's what art is. It's, it's more than just drawing something, you know. It's, it's actually studying it and looking at it. And uh, next, please. Okay. Fortune cookie lesson. There's nothing you can do. This, this is actually a uh, – this is crazy. Uh, I had Chinese food at a restaurant, and this is an actual real, real, real uh, fortune that I got. I, I opened up the cookie, and that's exactly it. Don't be so critical and overly concerned about details, right? Students, I have a, a bunch of my students here, right, Janet and Ken. Uh, Janet and Ken back there, they've been with me for 10 years in my class, so, so, um, but that's 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 pretty much it. Um, nothing you do wrong. That's the first thing we always talk about. Nothing you can do wrong. You can improve. You can get better. You can get better. But it's not really you can do it wrong. Next, please. Inspire to be ordinary. Have fun like a kid. Don't be such a grown up. Okay. You have enough time, especially with the news. You hear about the news today. Oh my gosh. Um, 
there, there's plenty of time for that. Make time for yourself and make time for nobody else but just yourself. And uh, you'll find out that things are a little lighter and things you'll be a little happier too, you know. Actually, we did paint this in class. So I was, uh, for one, uh, we did paint this in class and uh, uh, I, I was wondering, what are we gonna do in class today? What, what subject? So here I'm in the bathroom, you know. Oh, great, this is, what we're, this is the subject for today. You know? So we painted it, which was, which was fun. Next, please. Jump in, okay, enough of me talking. Um, let's jump in then. What do you think? Okay, all righty. So anyway, uh, is this mine? Oh, this is great. Thank you, whoever. Thank you so much, this is great. Dan, did you want to say anything about the reference drawing before you get started? Yes, yes. I'm going to talk about this. Yeah, um, a lot of times, um, usually, it's going to be a little unusual because usually um, in class or when I'm painting, I'll, I'll see something, I'll take a photo of something, like Mushroom Village, I saw the photos of mushrooms, take that, and I follow the photo. Um, it's best sometimes um, when you and paint from real life. And that's what I did here with this reference. I don't have a photo uh, at the Field Museum. Um, I, I did this um, I did a little sketch. In the Field Museum, you can go in there certain days. Um, you can go in with a sketch pad and pencils or whatever, and you can actually sketch the animal. So I went down to an obvious icon, the big African elephants um, in the, the rotunda there. Um, classic, they were captured in what was it, 1909, I think it was, uh, and stuff. And to, it, to today, um, I'm, I'm sure all of you have seen it. If you're from Chicago, you've all seen the elephants down there. They are considered the Sistine Chapel of, of, of uh, taxidermy. Um, they, by uh, the professional taxidermists uh, all over, will say, this is the, the epitome. This is the, the top um, specimen of, of taxidermy, 1909. Um, and fast, I've, I've sketched it uh, oh, a few times and all different angles. So I thought I'd paint it today. And this is basically a sketch that I did. I was sitting there doing a the sketch. And then um, I'm going to brought it home. I thought, well, maybe I, I did paint it. And we'll, 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 we'll try it today. I'll show you how... I uh, usually paint pretty fast. Watercolor is meant to be fast. And I think I will stand back a little bit here. Can you see that okay? All right, so um, this, is what, this is what it looks like right there. The most important thing about this is uh, the drawing. It's got to be somewhat accurate. But uh, notice mostly uh, the values, the lights and the dark areas. Light and dark areas, that's what makes a painting. Not so much the color. If you go down and you look at them, the color is pretty much gray, you know. Um, but we're going to go beyond that. We're going to do something, something a little different. I'm going to add, I'm going to bring it a light because give it a little more feeling overall. So, see that okay? All right. Um, let's start out with some earth tone colors. Make a nice little pool of water here. A nice pool here because I want to make sure I don't run out in the middle of painting. And I have a little, I usually have a little test sheet there. All right, let's uh, start right about, I'm going to do it right about here.
big wide brush, one inch wide brush. Uh, this is Arches, 300 pound. Keep it nice and wet in here. Yeah. Wet. Make sure you get up some water in here. Come around. Bump, bump, bump. Underneath. And if you don't mind the interruption, someone is asking why you chose to start there in the painting. I'm sorry, what was that? Why did you choose to start where you did on the, in the painting? How, how did you decide where to start? Oh, where to start? I started at the top. Started at the top. The board is kind of at an angle. So I started at the top and the water is just kind of flowing downward. Flowing downward. So um, I'm just kind of, then I kind of come around, start at the top, coming around. <laughs> While it's still wet, I just drop in a little, in pigment, drop in some pigment there. Paper itself dry. Paper is dry, yes, paper is dry. I'm not working wet into wet. There are times when you might want to work wet into wet, but right now I am just using, um, making sure that the paper, I use a lot of water. A lot of water. Just as a reminder to those that are here in person, uh, if you raise your hand, we'd be happy to bring the mic over to you. Uh, that way uh, the at-home audience can hear your question as well. Thanks. Purple. I, I guarantee if you went down to the uh, Field Museum, you would not see purple in uh, that African elephant. But this is my elephant, so I can, I can do that. Let's do this. Blue, let's get some blue in the shadows. Blue down here. More water. Water here. Oh. Down.
And uh, let's try, let's do, let's get some more. Oh boy, I kind of like that. Dan, someone's asking, are you applying the darker colors based on your drawing? Yes, exactly. I'm kind of following that right there. I put my value sketch. That's exactly what I'm following. Um, lights and darks. If you think in just terms of lights and darks, um, and stick with that, um, it's, it's, it, you'll, you'll find it's easier to paint that way. And sometimes when you take a photograph, um, the camera just sees everything. You know, it doesn't break it down into, into specific uh, values. It's always good to look at something, especially if you're painting it, something that um, is a light. Look for the light areas. Look for the medium tone areas, the medium gray, so to speak, or medium tone areas. And then look at the dark, where the darks are going to be. And uh, if you do that, your chances are you'll you'll do okay. Get some more water here, Dan. Talking to myself, that's always good. Get some water. Sometimes you do that. Sometimes you have to remind yourself. Oh yeah, use more water. More water. There have been a couple of questions about your palette, and you, you did give us uh, the PDF to send out to everyone uh, so that people would have the opportunity to download that. Uh, but perhaps at some point when it is a good place to insert that, we could uh, focus in on your palette and maybe uh, talk about some of the colors there. Uh, someone is asking about uh, the different colors that you're using and uh, of course about your brushes as well. Oh yeah, I can, I can mention more about the, the colors pretty much are um, the earth tone colors are burnt sienna and burnt umber, which are the ones right over here. Um, using a lot of those right now and a lot of water, letting it mix around, let it kind of flow down. I'm using the same one inch brush, so wide brush, right? So a wide, big brush. And I'm just trying to, I have a medium tone. I can make this a little darker later on, but right now I just want to get a nice overall, uh, nice overall feel of the lights in the dark areas. And what was the blue that you were dipping? The blue, uh, the phthalo blue and the alizarin crimson. Take those two right over here. You see those two right there. Glycerin crimson, phthalo blue, you got a beautiful purple, beautiful violet color. And that's what kind of this is. I mean, you have to see there's some violet colors there. I don't know if that shows up on the screen, but. Um, and you mentioned that it was a one inch brush. Is it natural hair or synthetic? This is a one inch. Um, it's a um, it's a synthetic blend. Um, a one inch of silver black velvet. I mean, that technically that's the name of it. Silver black velvet. Very nice brush. Very nice brush. Do you have a favorite brand? Do you have a I'm, favorite brand of brush? The brand? The brand is, um, I guess it's called black velvet. I mean, if you were to look, look that up, I think that's, you'd, you'd get to it. So let's look, now I'm gonna go back to the front part of the second big guy here um, over on the right side. I'm gonna go back and I'm starting, let's mix this up a little bit here. Take a little of the uh, quinacridone gold, quinacridone gold, and let's start at the top here again. Again, my board is at a slant here. See, I have a, a, have a brace underneath there. So it's slanted. So I'm starting at the top. And then I'm just going to, with the big brush, I'm just going to go up here and put sound effects are important. 
across there. Don't worry about the eyes and things like that. Those are just little detail-y things. You know, you do that. Brush coming down. Light areas. Some more. Uh, these are, let's get a, some of the Gamboge, new Gamboge, He's yellow. This is the new Gamboge. I just use because I like the sound of a Gamboge. <laughs> Sounds cool. Okay. Sienna, turn Sienna in here. Kind of put that over in his ear here. Coming down. Yeah. This tusk. There, 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 there. Like that. Now this may look a little dark for me, so all I'm going to do is I'm going to come back with a thirsty brush, pick that up a little bit. That be fine. Yeah. And then uh, let's see, let's go down to here. Got a question from our in person audience here. How often do you have to change your water to start out with clear rinse water? Oh, yeah, the one water will just uh, last for a whole painting. I believe in painting in one sitting, even though I'm standing, uh, painting in one sitting. Um, not at one time. It's almost it oils. Any some of the other uh, art uh, media, you know, oils you could spend on uh, days on one painting. You know, um, I like the idea of painting in one sitting. It's always uh, so. Yeah, the water will last for one sitting. Definitely. Let's go back over here now. Let's get started at the top again. Boop. Yeah. Burnt uh, umber, burnt umber, bup, bup, bup. Burnt umber, maybe add a little ultramarine blue, kind of gray it down a little bit. Yeah. Or water. Let's put a little more blue in here. Purple, that flow down, water. One thing I didn't, oh, uh, yeah. Actually, maybe I'll do this in a little bit, but uh, well, don't go away. Um, this is uh, the texture. Some of my students you know what I'm going to do here, right? 
Coffee, exactly. Instant coffee. While it's still wet, drop in some instant coffee. Here's a nice, some nice texture. Now, you may not be able to see it right away because it has to dissolve. That works better, a little better in a bit. Some, uh, let's put a little uh, picking up burnt umber and phthalo blue. Really cool, kind of a neat green here. Dan, can you, can you repeat what you added for the texture? Uh, added? Oh, it was, uh, this is actually instant coffee. It's actually instant coffee. Uh, Nescafe. All right, fine. Nescafe. You want a brand name? It's Nescafe. It's instant coffee, not regular coffee. It's like crystals and like an, it's a pigment, really. Really, when you think about it, you laugh. But it's called, but the, the the coffee basically is a bean, right? It's an organic uh, uh, element that, um, just like any of the other uh, pigments that are here, made from something that's natural, and it. Uh, just like uh, just organic, it's from the earth. And that's basically what a lot of the uh, earth tone, or, or all these pigments are made of, something from, from, the, from, the, uh, from the earth. Okay, so let's do this. I mean, there's other tricks to it. And basically those are like tricks. I mean, you can add salt. Salt is kind of a, another element that you can use, but uh, salt has a different effect. Spraying with alcohol. It's a different effect also. So those are, those are fun little tricks that you can use. And, but don't overdo it. Sure. Someone is asking with the purple, did you uh, mix colors to create that purple or use purple directly from your palette? No, uh, I don't have a purple. You know, I mean, you can go to the art supply store and you can buy, uh, there's a billion colors. I mean, billion tubes of colors, right? And um, it's it's kind of confusing, um, but they have all different colors. Um, all you really need are a basic, simple palette. And the colors that I have on that sheet that's around here, um, those are the only colors I ever use. I don't buy a purple. I make my own purple. Uh, I will, uh, no black, never use black, never use, obviously don't use white. And um, make my purple with the alizarin crimson and the phthalo blue, which are the two, right, I put them right next to each other for that reason. As you're checking back at that reference photo, perhaps at some point you could show it to us again also so that we can maybe look at uh, the part that you're looking at as you're deciding what to paint next and what colors to use. Oh, what colors to use? Um, or, or whatever whatever information you're getting from the reference photo is you or the reference images you're looking back. Okay, yeah, the, 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 only, the only one image I have is my sketch. And the sketch uh, reminds me basically the anatomy of an elephant because I can't remember that. The colors come from me, the artist. It comes from you, the artist. Um, how, where the colors come from, it's the colors that you put into it to give it life, to give it spirit, to make it look like these elephants are still kind of alive and not just gray. Um, and you can turn it up, you can turn it down. You can turn it up to be very lively, um, or you can kind of uh, mute it down a little bit and bring it back more towards 
reality, I guess, reality of the, the actual um, uh, stuffed animal down there. Right now, I'm just going to, okay, so I have everything pretty much covered. Now I'm going to go back while this is, so this is dry. Now I'm going back up in here. And I have my, I have the lights, I have the whites. Obviously the tusks are gonna be white. I have the medium tones, medium tones I, I have down there already. Now I'm gonna come back and start just refining some of the areas with some little, little richer, darker colors. I'm still using a, a nice, Brush. I'm using a mop brush here. Um, this is a number six brush. I don't know if you can see that. Kind of a number six mop brush. Mop brush is really nice and uh, holds a lot of water. Um, and um, it's really fun to, uh, to paint with. I think I'll put my glasses on. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh, you knew I was going to do that, right? It's like, oh my God. Sometimes you need some patience. So I'm just going to do this. So now, um, everything I put down before, you, you, you saw everything was wet into wet in the sense that I put down a pigment. And then before that first pigment dried, I would just drop in another pigment into that first wet pigment and it would blend itself you know don't you know it, watercolor it's it's a partnership it's you and it's the media the medium itself the medium itself and like any partnership you know it's a give and take type of thing you got to uh, don't try to control everything yourself because the medium is going to get upset at you and just like not do what you want to do and you won't like what the medium's doing and uh, so um, you have a lot of respect for it in the sense that I just put down a pigment color, wet color you saw, and then I took another color and I dropped it into it, and it just kind of did its own thing. It just kind of it just kind of blended out. It just kept going, and because the board's at a slant, it, gravity um, is a part of it. Gravity um, is part of nature, so you're using gravity. You're using water. And you're using humidity, like in here, it's pretty dry. So I, you know, winter time, usually rooms are dry. So you have to take that in consideration in that it's gonna dry quicker. It's gonna dry quicker too. In the summer on a rainy day, it's very humid. You'll paint, paint, and it will never dry. It seems like it never dries. You know, you, 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 you pull out the hair dryer, hair dryer. But when it's dry like this, it'll dry quickly. So, you know, you're working with nature, you know, the water, the humidity, um, if you're outside, you have the sun. If you're painting outside in a location, oh my gosh, the sun the sun uh, hits your, your your painting surface. It, it almost dries instantly. Very difficult. You got to stay in the shade type of thing, you know. Um, so my first um, pass was uh, blending color into color, letting it blend itself. Now, this is dry. I'm coming back now with, a, a, again, a, a, now it's a pointy brush, pointy brush pointy brush. And I'm just going to come back and I'm going to look at my reference photo here, like up in this area here. I'm going to just make that a little, a little, a little darker up in that area. So it's not so too bright, you know. Kind of come up in here. That. Boom, boom, boom. And then the eye area here, there, there's an eye in there someplace, I know, but uh, I don't worry about that. I can, I'm going to put that in later. I just know the area, it's right about, boom, right about in there. You know, the area that the eye is kind of sitting in the socket, you know, that's what I'm more concerned about. My head, My head's not getting in the way, is it? 
Okay. It's been known to happen. Okay, what I made, what I'm going to do is the uh, shadow area. It's always good if you're painting something, just think in terms of light and shadow, uh, light and shadow, um, warm and cool. So light areas where the sun is hitting, sun's, the sun's coming from the, the sky. And um, so it's going to be light on top, shadow underneath. So it's going to be, in my case, in this case, it's, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, light from the top is going to be warm warm light from the warm sun and cool shadows are down below. And if you think of those terms, just that, you know, you, you uh, it's hard to go wrong, you know, just know where the lights and the darks are going to be. So this is dark in here and this dark here, you know, so I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be dark according to my sketch. Make that dark in there too. Boom, put it, push down on it. Push it down on the, uh, the other time here. Now I want to bring out this tusk. So Tusk is already white, so I'm just going to make the background behind it dark, and it will just boom, just bring out that that tusk right out at us. Dan, what's your normal studio setup? Are you standing at an angle like this, or do you have a higher? Uh, yes, uh, tables are usually higher. At at home, my table is a little higher, so I'm not bent over as much, you know. But um, yeah. But I, I pretty much stand up, except maybe, maybe towards the end I will uh, um, sit down for a little bit, but pretty much standing up. Because if you stand up, you'll find out that when you're standing, um, you're free, you're a little freer, you know, to move around, especially with watercolor, you know. Um, if you're able, stand up, and because um, then your whole arm is, rather than if you're sitting down, you know, you're sitting down, you're like this, you find yourself doing this, you know, you're painting with your, your wrist, your hand, you know, um, and you're tightening up a little bit, stand up at least at the beginning. And it really, it'll make a difference. I've heard that so many times when somebody, all of a sudden they start standing up and they go, oh, wow, I'm, I'm, you're, just, you're, you're into it more, you know, you're just, it's more, it's more fun too, you know, you just, you're not as tight. It's a little looser, and your painting will be looser, and that's what watercolor is known for, being loose. And that's what people always say about watercolor. Well, they like watercolor, they like it because it's loose and all that. We have a couple questions about paper. Uh, can you remind us, are you using cold press or hot press? Um, this is cold press, 300 pound arches cold press. So it has a nice texture to it. It's not real smooth like a hot press. It's really, it's cool. And uh, about the 300 pound paper, someone says that uh, for them, the 300 pound paper tends to fade out their colors. Any tips for that? Um, you adjust to it. Yes, you, after a while you realize you'll see that it dries a little lighter because it, it, it's heavier paper. It uh, absorbs a lot of water and more water is there. Um, eventually it, it dries. And when it dries, uh, naturally will dry lighter. Things will dry lighter. So you got to adjust to it and just keep adding, adding more pigment and less water. Someone else is asking, is it correct to say that you're using cool and more saturated colors to represent the dark, the darker values? Yes, yeah, good point. Uh, yes, I'm, I'm using uh, the warm 
The warm areas like up in here where the sun is hitting, warm, 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 uh, warm over here. And then down in here, uh, cooler colors, the greens, purples, blues, let them mix around and just let them go. Yep, so that would be good, yeah. Warm and cool, light and dark. And uh, let's see, let's do this. Okay, let's move over to this area here. Brush stroke, you, you know, don't be afraid to leave the brush strokes. Don't try to smooth everything out, you know. Just let the brush strokes show. You post impressionists, I mean, they're known for uh, showing, showing the brush strokes. That's what makes it, that's what makes it fun. Down in here, oop, oh, just get some nice big darks in here. Dark, dark, dark. Oop, oh, oop, oh, oop. Over here, and uh, let's go up in this guy's ear here, and uh, let's give a little more dimension to his ear a little bit. Here, black. I here, yeah, here is gonna make them just darker there. So up to this point, I'm just putting in shapes. I'm not concerned about little details or any things like that. Uh, that all comes later towards the towards the very end, really. Up to this point, it's all just cool things. We have a couple of questions about the features. Uh, if you can indicate where you're going to be putting in the eyes, a person says they can see the tusk and the trunk, but they're not quite sure where you're going to be putting in the eyes. Oh, I mean the eyes here? I mean, I, I believe so. Yes. I where know. they're at? Well, I really don't have the eyes in here. <laughs> they're basically just kind of the eye socket areas, you know. Um, and I know the eye is going to be somewhere in there. And when I get into the detail, um, I hate to use the word detail, but when I start putting in some of the finishing touches, then that's kind of when I always think it starts coming alive. And then you start seeing things. And you start putting the little accent marks here and there. Um, the eye and the tusk will be fine, that tusk. And even the, the trunk here. Even the trunk, I'll uh, put a little more dimension to here, put this a little darker, and you see that'll just kind of pop out a little bit more. And even in here, underneath here, whoop, like that. Come around. Like that. Push that down. Once you start, so I so far I have the light. Obviously, the white. 
the, the lightest area is the, the white, obviously, I mentioned, the white tusk. And then the, a light medium is kind of the head where the lights hit, the, the sun is hitting it, the top part. And medium values kind of in these shadow areas. And then I'm starting to add some of the dark areas. I'm starting to get working my way into the dark areas. But then the detail, that's at the end. So stay tuned. <laughs> and sometimes people are working on it. They want to get to the end result um, quickly, you know, and you have to build up to it and study nature. I mean, that's, that's basically what it is. Look at, um, I've already looked at these elephants. So I pretty much have a pretty good, because I've looked at them and thought, wow, it's amazing what the creatures that they are. Um, and so I've really kind of studied, so I have a pretty good idea of their anatomy and all that. And now it's just a matter of taking it and and, and you kind of paint it in your head, so to speak, I guess. And then you just kind of, they always say when you're creating something, you, you do it twice. You paint it once in your head. And then the next one is you, then you put it down on, on the medium that you're working on. Okay, let's put a little more, a little more in here, and whoosh, it's not enough. A little bit more, but there. Okay, that's shaping up. And too many times I notice people, at least, um, when, especially with watercolor, they, oh, they're, they're questioning themselves all the time. I don't know, is it right? Is it right? Is it wrong? You know, and they start making changes. Well, try not to make changes. I haven't really made any changes. I haven't gone back and started, oh my gosh, that's too dark. So make it lighter. Or I don't like that brush stroke, so I try to blend it out. Or, you know, you try to, uh, try to, you're making, you're, making a decision and then you're questioning yourself and you change it right away, you know, rather than if it's not exactly what you want, let it be, go on, keep moving forward. Um, have, have confidence in that you can do it. So uh, it does take a certain amount of confidence um, to do it and just do it and don't keep questioning yourself, you know, and going back. I think it's kind of, it's kind of true in life too. You know, you just have confidence to do something. You don't question every, everything you do, you know, um, just kind of go ahead and try it. And if it doesn't work out, well, you learn from it, you know. Okay. So I don't know. How's that look? Is it looking okay or right? So it's kind of a, the back of my head looks good too. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is, time is, what I'm going to do, I'm going to circle back here and let's just try. When you're cleaning your brush, Dan, what what are you uh, wiping your brush on as you're cleaning your brush? Oh, yeah, good point. Uh, basically, I have my palette, which we're familiar with, mixing tray, uh, water, and just a sponge. And the reason I'm touching the sponge is to the water uh, container here is to put water on my brush, obviously. And then sometimes I may have too much water on here, and I just take some of the water off of the brush. So it's putting water on the brush, taking some of the water. And sometimes I just wipe some of the old pigment that I'm not using and I want to change the change the pigment. So wash it off, dry it off a little bit. And then I can uh, dip into another color without um, contaminating the color with too many colors. So yeah, just a regular kitchen sponge. Which you buy, buy for like, 59 cents. You go to art supply store, that, that sponge would be about $4. You know? So don't buy anything at the art supply store if you don't have to. Go to, go to, hard, go to hardware store. Okay, so let's, uh, maybe I will sit down a little bit. Oh. And I'm going to grab 
a brush. Okay, we better. I have a billion brushes here, but I only use a few of them. <laughs> but I always say people see all those brushes, and they go, oh, wow, they're really impressed. They go, he must really be good. <laughs> Look at all the brushes he has. <laughs> you know, they don't really, don't really use them. So let's uh, go back and... Uh, so okay. what is the brush that you're using? Oh, now? this is this one is also it's a, just a smaller brush now. It's a number six. Also, this is also a silver black uh, velvet, um, black velvet. Good brush, um, a, little, a little on the pricier side, um, but there are some other brushes that are um, Scepter Gold Two is a good brush. Scepter Gold Two, um, very good value. It's a synthetic brush or. Uh, Synthetic blend, it's natural hair and uh, synthetic hair. And it really, before we do that, let's do this. Pick up some yellow here, just a little bit of yellow. And I'm going to, so I'm, I'm going back to my, um, gosh, kind of bouncing back here. Husks uh, white, but I'm just gonna add a little shadow, a little yellow, kind of give an ivory color to it, just to give it a little bit of dimension. Yeah. Color there. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Maybe I'll do the, do the same thing over here. Put on gold, good color. Favorite color. Okay, now I'm gonna go back. I'll start putting some of the darks now. And this is hopefully when the starts taking life. You know, right now it's basically just some shapes. Now I want to give it some energy. Hey, yeah, it's alive. It's alive, it's alive. All right, and I do have to look at the, the eye, see where the eye is. According to my sketch, I'm going to say, get him out here. And I'll start putting in uh, some boots. They start to make a, I don't have black and I want to get a really nice dark deep color. So I make my own black by using uh, ultramarine blue and the Burnt umber, you get a rich, nice black. It's a, it's a lot more li It's a livelier black, which kind of sounds kind of weird. But um, if you get black right out of the tube, it's like black is black. Whereas if you mix your own black, you have a uh, some really nice darker grays, black, um, and you have almost like a warmer, and it, you, you control the temperature. 
you control the temperature of the blacks and the grays. Sometimes you want a little cooler. It's actually kind of fun once you get into it. Once it starts looking like something, then you think, oh yeah, this is gonna, it's kind of neat, you know. It's like working, some people work out crossword puzzles, and you know, it's it's relaxing, and, and you kind of get to get beyond that frustrating stage. And if you stick with it long enough, you you will find out that it's a work more fun because there's like I said I mean part of this I knew what I was going to be doing but uh other than that I just have an idea what I'm doing but I don't know exactly you never know exactly if it's going to turn out or not Okay, this guy is this, uh, his buddy over here who is I or her buddy. Let's, just, let's see, what color should I make it? Once I did a chicken with a green eyes. Boy, I heard it from some people. Chickens don't have green eyes. They're orange. Yeah, okay, well, turn out to be a green eyed chicken. Yeah, you can make it to the first. The starter, doo -doo -doo. let's get that dark in there. Does dry uh, again, dries a little lighter, so you got to keep that in mind. And sometimes you just kind of use your finger, just push things around a little bit. Dan, can you repeat what you use to make your black? To make the black, oh, yeah, you can make an excellent black or any really warm or cool dark grays. Um, ultramarine blue and the burnt umber can't go wrong. Ultramarine blue, burnt umber. You want a little a warmer gray, use more burnt umber. Uh, you want a cooler gray. Now you can go out and buy a tube of Payne's gray. Basically, it's Payne's gray, but it's always Payne's gray. That's the name of Payne's gray. It'll always be that same gray, 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 gray. Whereas if you mix your own, get in the habit. Mixing your own grade, then you have a whole, it opens up a whole wide variety of 
beautiful gray. You can you can make a beautiful painting just monochromatic, just in grays. You know, it's just some really beautiful paintings in gray. And last last summer we were going the plein air paintings, and I was just doing my plein airs with just in grays, doing landscapes and just grays, and they were really kind of fun. They were just um, some really neat uh, neat effects. Let's put this big old ear, the kind of ear. They said that this, uh, these African elephants, um, field museum, um, they're in kind of rough shape. I mean, after all these years, the um, just the natural elements, the air, and everything else has really taken a toll on the hide because this is the actual real hide of the elephants, you know. But the inside is basically all a metal structure, you know, metal and wood structure and stuffing and all that. But the hide is all original, and that's really kind of taken a toll on. It's kind of in bad shape, and it's cracking. They've been doing some repairs on it. So these guys who are restoring it, I mean, they feel it's such an honor to be able to just work on it. You know, if we can go back to the issue of the water again for for a moment uh, an artist is is saying they usually uh keep changing the water so their water so that the paint doesn't get contaminated with the color that's in the rinse water uh how is this uh not a problem for you or or how do you get around that well, it, it, you really can't contaminate it because these colors are kind of, in a sense, are when they're blending together, they're kind of contaminating, if you had to use that word, you're kind of blending each other. And so the water is kind of just the colors blending together also, you know. Now, if I were, you, if I were to go back now, because I'm working with darker colors too, um, I don't really care how dark this water gets. Now, if I were to go back and say I was working in a lighter area, um, yeah, and yeah, I would wouldn't want to get some of the muddier water in there because I want brighter colors, more intensity of the color, and the muddier water would kind of mute down that brighter color, you know. So, and, and if you use a big enough container, um, it's 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 not a problem, not a problem. And let's do okay. Come on, let's keep going here. But here again, it's art, you know, it's not, if it's a little muddier, well, okay. Um, it's okay, you might come up with some interesting, interesting surprises too. I'm gonna go back to a bigger brush. I don't like to use small brush too much. I always like the bigger brushes and I'm gonna go over here, boom, boom, boom. Shut down. Yeah. And then shadow underneath the tusk. Get out. Now let's do this. The hide is so fascinating, just the way that the thickness of the hide and the way it wrinkles. And I'm going to try to catch that. Stand up here.
and a little, oh, kind of a, it's just pushing in there, get a little texture in there, a little more. Darks, get some nice darks in there. Nice dark in here. Go back in here. And let's do this. Yeah, and someone's asking about uh, your strategy here as you're kind of finishing and putting in some background. Oh, the background. You thought about the, the overall background? What am I going to be doing? Uh, I'm not quite sure from the question, but uh, it's specifically what is your what is your strategy finishing the background oh okay strategy for finishing the background what do you think <laughs> <laughs> well uh i think i'm going to leave well seriously i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to keep the the background well you'll see but I, my thinking first of all i'm painting it in my head right now and then i'll show see if it shows up on the painting but i'm thinking that um, I want to get more action in here. I want to bring these elephants alive more. Um, so I think the background would be, I'm thinking almost maybe more abstract in a sense of, and, and, and some movement. I want to get some movement in the background. So, I mean, that's the strategy anyway. Um, get something going so it almost gives them a sense of motion. Um, but I'll do that kind of tour right at the end right at the end anyway and um so yeah i think the background that's that's a good question it's almost like you have to think ahead of time you know what do you want to do with that what do you want to do with that background you know someone's wondering uh, would it be possible to add a lighter accent uh like a blue at this point or would it have to be opaque for it to show a blue for which for what there? there. Uh, let, let me, I'll repeat it. Is it possible to add a lighter accent, for example, blue or something like that at this point, or would it have to be opaque? Oh, opaque? To, I think they're asking about adding a lighter accent, what, how you would do that if you chose to at this point. Um, lighter accent. Well, the, my lightest areas are going to be at this point, my lightest area is going to be the tusks. Okay. The tusks and the sunlit area of their, of the top part of their heads. And I don't see, I don't, if I plan it correctly, uh, I shouldn't have to go back and say, oh, I'm gonna make that lighter, lighter, lighter. Cause, uh, watercolor, it is a little more difficult to, to lighten something. So you have to work from the, you start with white paper and you kind of work your way down the value scale. The white, light uh, color, uh, medium value, and then darker value, you know. So you kind of work your way down. So it's hard to go back. Although you, there's a, there is a way of lifting color. You can wet it and scrub it and, 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 and bring up some of the color off of the paper. You can, you can do that. But sometimes it looks a little uh, forced. It looks a little... It starts getting a little um, scrubbed, and it's not as fresh looking. So I, I don't know if that answers the question, but I think it's a matter of uh, planning ahead of time. You know where your where your lights are going to be, and not have to worry about lightening them up again, lightening things up. 
over here. And here I have a nice uh, phthalo blue, very vibrant blue. I'm gonna mix it in with a little what I have already on the tray. And I'm just gonna put in some, make sure I have some more water in here. And I'm just gonna put that there. Yeah. That's all, just a couple of little brush marks down in that corner. It's just too light in that corner. Um, and then another thing is I'm thinking maybe this could be a little darker here. Like that. And then what I do is, uh, well, we're getting there. We're getting there. We'll make it. Looking for my, looking for my toothbrush. And here, toothbrushes. I have, I have a bunch of toothbrushes here. See, toothbrushes. Um, and I'm just going to. This is just basically for texture. Just add a little of. The, I'm putting some of the pigment on. On the toothbrush. There. Dip it right in there. Yeah, nice, nice, nice. Come on, come on, come on. Get on there, get on there, get on there. It's a new toothbrush. And what's your idea behind leaving some white marks? Oh, the, the white flecks? Yeah, I, I, I like to leave white flecks in there. I, I think it, it kind of adds a little liveliness sometimes. A uh, little highlights here, flecks. Uh, um, there's really no specific reason that you could say why white flex, but it just always seems to lend a little liveliness to, to a painting, I think. Sometimes more, sometimes less. Sometimes they get in the way. And if they get in the way, you can always knock them down by just painting over them. But I kind of just like leaving some of those. Now I'm just adding a little texture with uh, a toothbrush here. I think I've mentioned this once before that I was in class one time and somebody came up to me and says, can I borrow your toothbrush? <laughs> you have to be an artist. Then. I mean, uh, taken out of context, that would be weird. Dan, can you show us how you're applying the pigment to the toothbrush? Oh, uh, it's a uh, difficulty when you you're bending over. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, you so the head. all I'm doing is uh, I have my toothbrush, and you can just dip it right into the pigment if you want to do that. Uh, but if you don't have it, I just take uh, uh, take some uh, pigment and just put it right into the brush. That's all. Simple. Nothing. Nothing scientific about it. Just putting some. Any color I'm using, kind of red. Maybe I'll take some. You can mix some different colors in here. So it's loaded up with pigment. I'm just running my thumb over it. I'm just running my thumb over it, and it just kind of go right over it. And it just adds some neat little. Yeah, it's almost like spraying. Yeah, it's almost like spraying it. Yeah, exactly. It's almost like spraying. When you. Um apply that splatter or texture. Um, if it gets into the background space, is that just gonna become part of the background abstract or? Yeah, if I get it over here into the white area, I don't worry, yeah, I don't worry about it. Um, it's okay, it's, it's okay, don't worry about it. Now, if, you're, if you really wanna keep that pristine, I would cover that up, you know, but I'm, you, you get pretty good at, you know, targeting it where you want it to go. And uh, so you kind of just put it wherever you wanna do it. No, again, don't overdo it. Stop me before I overdo it. Get a little up here, maybe a little bit here. Does that look okay or what? I I kind of I see it back there too a little bit. Can you see that up close a little bit? Oopsie, he's going to move my head out of there. I don't know how I'm doing this right. Oh, I see. 
But sometimes you gotta you gotta look at it, make sure you look at it up close. I don't know if you can see that or not, but make sure you look at it up close and it will uh now the background, yeah. Hold on, let's uh see where we're gonna do this. We and I do... think this question relates to the background. They're asking, do you normally use colors already in your painting for the background? Yeah, good, uh, good question. Very good question. Yeah. Uh, uh, to make my background, I want to make the background um, part of the painting. You know, it's got to be uh, the colors have to mingle. They have to uh, work together. You don't want to go back and say, OK, now I'm going to do the background. I'm going to get some background colors. You know, you don't want to do that. Otherwise, you're going to have two, two things. You're going to have the subject and you're going to have the background and they won't really go together. So you want to use. So all I'm going to do right now is I will. Just grab a bigger, nice, nice big brush. This is a one and a quarter inch uh, hake brush or haki, a Japanese brush called haki brush or H A K E hake. And I'm just going to take what I have here in my my mixing tray, and I'm just going to take all of this. I'm going to take all of this because this is all part of the elephant. So this is the elephant right here, right? And I'm going to make that part of the uh, part of the background, you know. And it's going to wind up gray. We all know that. Add a little more water here, or water. And um, what I could do, let's do this. Lift that up like that, and uh, a little bit more water. And let me add a little more. Now, the only thing I really need to be concerned about is if what temperature I want to do. Do I want to go cool background or a warm background? I think I may, I may start. I may go cool actually because because the elephants are so warm. I just make it maybe a little cooler. That's all. So it'll be a cool gray. So I'm just mixing a cool gray here. Some of this, a little bit more of that. Kind of a neutral gray right now, but I'm just going, going cooler. Now I'm going my little test sheet here. Yeah, why not? Um, let's see. Sometimes this is the hardest part for people. They spend all that time on their painting, and then they think, "Oh my God, ruin it!" But just uh, just go over it and see what happens. You know. Yes. Pardon me? Well, my head's in the way. Oh my gosh. Okay, my big head's in the way. Okay, right. Thank you for mentioning that. So over here. The one, th one thing you don't want to do is want to pick up this water along the edge here. Pick that up. 
Yeah, pick this up over here. Otherwise, it'll have a tendency to run back into your painting. All right, let's see how this. Now, it gets a, a point when when you're painting, you slow down, you think, okay, well, let's see, let's think about this. Stop and look at it and ask yourself, uh, knowing when to stop is important. <laughs> knowing when to stop. Otherwise, you'll kind of keep going and keep going and working on it, working on it. You say, oh, this is really looking good. I can make it a little bit better and just keep working on it. Uh, Take your time, stop, take a break, go for lunch, come back, look at it again. And then if you still think you want to work on it, then fine, go for it. But uh, take a break from it and look at it uh, maybe a little later on because uh, it's better to underwork a painting than overwork a painting because you've heard people doing watercolors that are muddy, overworked, um, and that's where you don't want to go. You want to be able to just stop at a point, and I'm letting it dry right now while I'm talking. This is time, it's drying time, really. And I'm letting it dry, it'll dry a little lighter. And then you step back and look at it and say, okay, um, it's time to stop. Sometimes it takes another person to look at it and ask another person, ask another artist, you know, say, what do you think of it? You know, and they'll say, hey, it's great. It's great. And then, and then those, then you'll say, well, what if I just do the, and the other person hopefully will say, hey, no, no, leave it the way it is. Leave it the way it is, you know. Um, and it, 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 it kind of just helps out, you know. Um, so let this dry. And then I'm, I'm going to say, uh, I, if I look at this tomorrow, I'll probably think, oh, my gosh, I should do, you know. But maybe I'll just leave it at that. Um, Dan, what is the size of the paper that you're using? Uh, this is a half sheet, half sheet, uh, quarter sheet, 16 by 20. So we're talking either the 20 by 32, you know. Um, usually they sell watercolor paper in full sheets, by a full sheet, and then cut in half, half sheet, quarter sheet. That's the way they do it. Or you can buy a uh, tablet, you know, 12 by 16 is a nice handy size to um, work on. You know, if you're learning, 12 by 16 quarter sheet is a good is a good size. So anyway, I'm gonna I'm going to put a bow on it, so to speak, as they say. Somebody says that. Let's see. I don't know. Let's maybe I will. Yeah, I'm gonna. I think I'll call it that. I didn't want to put any more on. Let's see. It's still kind of wet, so yeah. You might want to slide it towards you a little bit for the camera. Oh, good. Can you see that? Ooh, boop, 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 there's a delay here. There's a delay action here. Yeah, <laughs> but I was just taking a look at it in, in person too. I think it works. I think it works better too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great. So just just a reminder, if you have any additional questions, please uh, raise your hand. We'll be delighted to bring the microphone over to you. And if uh, you're at home and you didn't get your uh, question asked yet, or uh, if maybe uh, you'd like clarification, please go ahead and put those in the Q&A. There are people zooming out there. Thank you to everyone who zoomed in too. I mean, gosh, thank you so much. Um, and if you have any questions, uh, let me know either afterwards. Uh,
feel free to email me uh, anytime. And if you have any questions, email me or um, if you have any ideas too, comments, uh, I'd love to hear them. Love to hear them. Right. Everyone who registered for this program will be getting a follow-up email, uh, hopefully later tonight. That will include uh, contact information for the DuPage Art League, uh, for Dan, and also another opportunity to, to click on that link uh, to download the palette that includes all the information about the brand of paint, the colors, uh, the placement on the palette. Again, if there are any other questions, go ahead and enter those. Uh, there's a lot going on in the chat, lots of uh, appreciation there.